Someone brought up directed unions, and they're very good to deal with in uh, in a power set of n, and so we might as well mention them here. And that's another way of thinking of continuity here, because as you're making finite approximations, if you're trying to approximate x, and you start out with a little finite set to say, well, why don't I approximate more? And so you take a larger finite set, and then you take a larger finite set to be even better, and so on here. And then you say that you have a directed union here that's going to the limit. If the union of the finite approximations that form a tower here is equal to the answer you want to get at. And so now it will turn out for continuity and the power set of n. Then another definition of continuity means preservation of limits. And that's really true for uh, arbitrary topological spaces. And so in the power set of n, it'll turn out this way. If you have a sequence of points in the power set, then a function is continuous if it's always going to be the case that the function value at the limit is equal to the limit of the function values. And you see, monotone functions should be uh, thought of here so that as you approach the limit of the argument, you're approaching as a limit the uh, function value there. And so this is another characterization of continuous functions. Let's think of it as applied to monotone functions. It says, the more the more, but if you only go a finite distance toward the limit, you only get a restricted distance in the values there. You can't jump too much there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, using powers like this and thinking of this as the analog of limit from the calculus, that's another definition of, mm -hmm. of continuous function. Let me look ahead here because... Do you want to do a break or shall I... I could carry on if you want. I think we need a short break because what I want to say here is maybe the continuous functions on the power set can be described by neighborhoods of the functions. And that's what we'll think of next there. It turns out if you work in calculus and real numbers, uh, the uh, uh, space of continuous functions from the reals to the reals is a quite complicated topological space. It doesn't work out too easily. You have to be careful about how you approximate functions. However, in the power set model here with this very simple finite approximation by finite sets, the functions work out as being very, very well behaved. And uh, we'll show you that as soon as we get a cup of coffee to bring us back to life. <laughs> All right, so maybe you'll I hope I can hold up. Maybe 10 minutes? Yeah, well, not 10 minutes. I mean, Five. seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure they're good. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it's really helpful so I don't get lost in the abstraction mm -hmm. when yeah. I understand why. Like, why is this important? Why do we care? Why, right. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. like, why, why? Why, 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 so, why are we talking about this? Right. So what's going to happen is that we, we want to be able to give a meaning to sort of say, okay, 
what is a function? Okay. What, is a, what is the meaning of a lambda? Lambda is just some syntax, but can we say that the meaning of a lambda is an actual mathematical function? Okay. Okay. Now it turns out that if you do that in a sort of a naive way, you run smack into some nasty problems. Okay. Um, you might think that, oh, like, well, so let's say, let's say you have some set A and some set B, and you're like, well, mathematically, you can have functions all, you can think about like all the functions from A to B, right? And like, let's say A just has like two elements in it, right? And B has like two elements in it, right? Then we can sort of talk about all the functions pretty easily. We can sort of tabulate like, oh, A1 goes to B1, and A2 goes to, maybe that goes to, yeah, yeah, all that onto stuff. This is, right, so that's one function. That was one function. Then we could talk about, okay, there's another function where A1 goes to B2, and so on. And we could just sort of enumerate all of them, right? Now, the f interesting thing is that how many elements are in here? There's two. There's two in here. How many different functions are there? Two. Right. Because, so it's gonna, that's because we're getting a decimal. Right. Yeah. And so the, the size of the functions from A to B is always bigger than A or B as sets. Right? Now with the lambda calculus, we're in this weird situation where you can you can you can pass functions to functions. Right? Yeah? And so it's like Okay, so we've got all the functions in here, and all the functions in here, and then we want to be able to say, okay, now we've got functions to functions. How many of those will there be? And it gets bigger, right? But how can you have? But how? So let's say d is like the set of all the functions, the lambda calculus definable functions. We need that to be the same as, or the same size as the functions from d to d. But now, but wait a minute. Because we can pass any function to a function. Okay. Oh, yeah, so basically D is not definable. It's an open, or something. Well, we get into this cardinality, the size problem, where you can't have this thing have the same size as that thing. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. And yet we want it. But we want it. It's like the set of all sets is not part of the sets. Yeah, it's kind so of it's that same thing. It's kind of like that, and okay. but now it's like the functions between sets is always bigger than Wait, the is sets. Bigger or the same size because he brought no, up a single this, set. No, this is always this well, is, one to one. Oh, okay, fine, yeah, okay. fine, yeah. So that one edge but case. we're not worried about that edge got it, got case. It, got it, got it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Now we're it's always bigger except for the time when they're actually the same size. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. So okay, so so we need so we need some setting where this is going to work out, and it turns out this power set of the n setting, the continuous functions on that set of the power set of n, that this is going to be okay. Because we're, because limiting, we're basically limiting the scope of how far... We're limiting, the, instead of talking about like all functions, yeah, we're, just talking the ones we're only going to be talking about the continuous functions. And therefore, that is true for continuous functions. And for functions. continuous functions, you can end up, you can have a set and then continuous functions on that set and end up with the same size. And a continuous function, the whole point about that, that's an into and onto, it, they're just well-behaved functions. Is that the idea of what a continuous well, function is? There's no missing epsilons. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even know what epsilon so, is. Oh, that's the approximation. They, they, yeah, you, can, you could always like get closer. And so in, in this setting of, of the power set of the natural numbers, this, what the continuity means is that if you, if you, need, if you, want, a, you want your output, if you want a finite amount of output, you only need a finite amount of input. Like, like let's say you're, you're interested in this particular output, but you, let's say you, just, you don't want, you're okay with a certain approximation to it. That approximation is gonna be some finite set, okay? Well, how do I get that much finite set output? Well, I have to, continuity says I, can, I just have to find a big enough finite set as input, and I'll finally get to that output. How does this relate to the whole intos, ontos? Yeah. Not directly. I mean, uh, I mean that's a. Sets. So is that yeah. related or not really? Because I keep not, choosing not that. Not as related. Together. I mean, okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, these are all, they're all functions. So they're going to be, you know, they always, you know, you never, if you have uh, one point on the input, it always goes to one on the output, right? That's what 
function means. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I have the easy way to say the answer here. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm not really getting the performance. Uh -huh. um, maybe, maybe if you sit closer, or if you guys have met that point where you're going to do yeah. that trade off, yeah. that you're going to do. And maybe his, I wonder if his voice maybe is quieter. So be, no. No? You're, no, it's just about We're both too far away. And so if when we get far away from each other, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah, 20, 10 feet away I will, from you, I will I, try to, I start losing him. I will so. be like a puppy dog. Well, I don't want to. No, it's your, fine. Vibe yeah, yeah, to, yeah. No, like no. I think, I think the puppy dog thing can be that. fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll just let you know. I'm gonna follow you around for purposes of microphone closeness. So oh. just don't be surprised if I'm <laughs> invading your personal space. No, no, no. no. It doesn't have to be too close. Yeah, yeah, five yeah. Feet. Five feet. Five feet. Only five. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make a joke out of it. Oh, no, that's fine. No, no, that's fine. I can't about this. Yeah. Sorry. Are you busy? Uh, no, I think we're. We'll wait for another minute or two. Okay, I'm confused a little bit uh, with uh, the final set of approximation. Yeah. Because in this uh, topology, all the points are actually infinite no, no, sets no, no, of they can be sets, of sets, right? No, no, no. The mm -hmm. points are just sets. sets they can be issues. either finite right. or infinite. The prime numbers, the odd numbers, uh, the numbers divisible by 17. The empty set. Yeah, okay. Just, just a set of integers. All right. Possibly finite, possibly infinite, either way. Okay. okay. I was yeah. suggesting this set. Uh, uh, oh, that's yeah. Oh, right. That's so you the define the... Oh, I'm sorry, then that's the, it. Yeah. What it could be that basis? Mm -hmm. The basis is like a... Yeah. Okay. But you could go slow. Okay. Sets? Okay. Oh, oh, right. sets but that's what was my right? Oh, sorry. Okay. So that, yeah, right. I and in this case, the basis yeah. will be all finite sets. Yeah, yeah. Right. You can pick out in any one right, of those right, sets. You can pick out and be like, okay, what's your neighborhood right, 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 of that right, finite right, set? And it's like, oh, it's all of the sets that contain it. Is equivalent to this definition over here. Sorry, can you repeat that again? Okay. Right. So yeah. the neighborhood yeah. of so the basis is all all the finite sets. Right. Right. So we're going to be using these finite sets as ways to approximate things. Right. Right. Yeah. And then what is the notion of approximation? What's the neighborhood of one of these things? It's just any set that that contains. Right. That finite yeah, set. Yeah. I think I just I didn't get the definition of uh, neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Yes. My fault. That that was the the problem. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, so I confusing with the. Oh. So this is it right there. Yeah. I mean, this is the very mathy sort of terse so definition. I thought, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought the definition of basis is a set of neighborhood. It is. It's the set of all the neighborhoods. That is a basis. A basis. A basis is yeah. all possible neighborhoods. For one point or just any neighborhood anywhere? Any neighborhood anywhere. So, so it's just it's like the set. It's like the, it's just another way of saying like the set sort of? Well, like, like I said before. Guys, let's start okay. again. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. After catching my breath, I think I can tell you how continuity works out here in a very simple way. Because when we were trying to see about approximating a particular set, if you take a particular set, then in various ways you can take just a little bit of the set X there. And there are many different measures of little bit there, but our friend over there was saying he wants to do it with a lot of power here. And you could just, every once in a while, take a selection out of the set. As long as you're increasing to infinity here, okay, the set itself is the limit of these finite approximations. Okay, so what does continuity mean? Continuity at x means if you take a finite approximation to f of x, And if f has a property of preserving limits, then since this will be the union of all the f's at the e of n's, you say, oh, I'm thinking of a finite set that's contained in a union of a bunch of sets. Well, how many out of the bunch do you need if you only have to satisfy a finite set? 
there'll, there'll be a certain place here where you have enough because you're getting more and more here out of it. There'll be a certain place where uh, 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 D is already contained in F of uh, some special one. Uh, sorry, you can't see it because it's behind the podium here. Uh, there'll be a special N0 that you eventually get enough. A finite set belongs to a union if it belongs to at least finitely many things out of the union. And so you only have to go a certain amount to get to this part here. And so if the function has this property of preserving unions of towers, it's bound to satisfy the definition that a neighborhood of f of x is already determined by a neighborhood of x. That's the other definition of continuity. But the other way around is if it's continuous in the terms of neighborhoods, then it's bound to preserve uh, the uh, unions there because if it preserves uh, the, uh, the, these, uh, if, if you're trying to show this thing here uh, uh, holds, you ask yourself, uh, I have to say it the right way. Mm. I'm having a blank here, just in terms of finite approximations. Oh yeah. If the function is continuous in terms of the neighborhood definition here, then we're going to pull this thing uh, here. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm assuming monotonicity on it to make it a little bit easier here. So since these are subsets of the union here, the inclusion holds that way. We just think of that as in terms of monotone property of there. Uh, I'm just trying to make it a little bit easier to get the, the, the important thing here. But now if the function is continuous in terms of the neighborhoods here, and if we take a finite approximation to f of this massive uh, union here, we say, wait a minute. I already checked by continuity that a finite approximation to f of thing only requires some finite approximation to the argument there. And so the finite approximation to the argument requires only finitely many of the ends there. And since this is a tower of increasing ones here, it'll already be achieved at some finite stage there. So finite approximations require that you only go finitely many steps in these things here. So those are equivalent definitions of continuity. I know I can't make you understand all of that in one go, but here is the key insight after thinking about the definition of topologies as a standard definition of continuity, and when you apply it to the power set of N, then here is the conclusion that you get, and you especially uh, uh, emphasize that we're applying it, be sure you think of monotone functions. If I take a continuous, continuous on the power set of n to the power set of n, if I take a continuous operator then, if you think in terms of neighborhoods and how they behave, you say, wait a minute, there are only countably many neighborhoods. The neighborhood of the function value is already determined by a neighborhood of the argument. So that means that F is completely determined by the finite E and D where D is a subset of F of E. You see, everything can be reduced to looking at the values on finite sets 
because finite sets make the limits to everything, and by preserving limits, you'll know everything if you do it. That's an important thing about continuous functions on the real line. Points on the real line are determined by a rational approximation, and they're only countably many rational. Continuous functions preserve limits. Therefore, if we take the function at rationals, when the rationals reach a limit, you have to get to the function value. But to a determine a point on the real line, you only need the rational approximation. So therefore, a continuous function is determined by the rational approximations to its evaluation of rational points. Therefore, there are only a continuum number of continuous functions on the real line. You see in terms of those uh, powers there, uh, with uh, Cantor's theorem, power said uh, cardinality of n, Cantor said, was L of zero, power set of the real numbers turned out to be 2 to the L of 0. And if we took all functions, all functions from the reals to the reals, just set, set, set theoretically, the cardinality of that would be 2 to the 2 to the L of 0. As you take all functions, you go up exponentially in the cardinalities there. But when we take continuous functions, they're not arbitrary. And they're completely determined by their rational approximations. So the continuous functions from real to reals only have the power of the continuum itself. You don't go to that next larger. So you end up still in here. You end up there. Mm -hmm. Even though the, there are lots of crazy continuous functions, because of the continuity and the rational approximations, you don't exceed that power when you take continuous functions. And so we're doing something of the same thing here, you see. When we go to continuous functions from the power set of, the power set of n, everything that can be determined by finite approximations, every function is determined by the finite approximations of its values at finite inputs there. And there are only a countable number of finite, finite sets altogether. So if we give a notation for finite sets, we ought to be able to have a notation for every continuous function from power set to power set. And that's what I'm about to do here. So mm -hmm. do yeah. it here. A couple questions out there. Yes. So what finite approximation I'm sorry? What would finite approximation look like for things that aren't set? Oh, I can show you some nice examples, but uh, uh, I, I can't. I can't stop. I can't stop to do it now. But, but uh, I mean, uh, this is only the example of one kind of domain from domain theory that relates to the lambda calculus. But there are lots of other domains which have other ways of giving finite approximations. And uh, they have some nice uses, but this is only the beginning part, so mm -hmm. I can't answer your question just immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we want to say is, look, there are only a countable number of integers, therefore there are only a countable number of pairs of integers, therefore there are only a countable number of pairs of finite sets of integers, and so if we want to talk about finite information, maybe we can index everything by integers. Seem reasonable? Okay, so pairing here, this is not the nicest pairing function from the point of view of computation because it uses an exponential, exponential but it's the shortest one I can think to write down. According to the, the uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic from Euclid, <coughs> every integer can be factored into prime factors, and so in particular, Every integer is uniquely factorable into a power of 2. And then what's the quotient? It has to be odd, because we don't have any more powers of 2 there. Of course, 
power of 2 times 2n plus 1 is positive there. So I subtract 1 here so that I have a 1 to 1 correspondence between pairs of integers and single integers. There are hundreds of different ways of, of, of doing that. People draw nice diagrams of when you want to take pairs of integers, you take a two-dimensional diagram. You can flow through the diagram in different ways. And many nice formulas. This is the shortest one I know to write down. So now I can also, by iterating pairs, uh, give a notation for all finite sequences. So I save zero for the empty sequence. And then if I have a sequence that's longer than length zero there, I use just the sequence number for the initial segment of it, plus one extra term there, but I have to make it positive there because zero stands alone by itself. Zero is empty sequence. I want to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So when I take the pairing function there, I have to make it positive so that I know there's a, now a one-to-one -one correspondence between all integers and all finite sequences. Fair enough? But sequences put things in order. A set doesn't have any order. So we can also say, well, maybe I can use numbers to represent sets there. And of course, it's a little bit redundant here, because what I'm saying, let a sequence number also represent the set of terms of the sequence. So that's a many one correspondence there. They're very nice formulas that you can figure out to give a one one correspondence between finite sets of integers and integers. I started with a one-to-one -one correspondence between finite sequences of integers and integers. And so I'm just being cheap here, saying, let the sequence be a notation for a finite set as well. Don't bother me. I don't really have to have a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence. <laughs> and now, a nice thing about approximations is that x star says, I'm the numbers that represent all the finite approximations to x. OK? It's not the same as x. <coughs> x is an infinite set, but it represents all the finite approximations to x in terms of finite, finite configurations of integers. And so now I can indicate a new definition of continuity that's related to that over there. If a function is continuous, then I say, well, a finite approximation to x, I mean to determine f x there, a finite approximation to f of x only needs finitely many m's that uh, are in the uh, f of x there. And if it's continuous, it means I can find a finite number of elements from x such that the fact that you get from n to m, there are only finitely many of them here, is what we've encoded up into f of x f itself can be encoded up into a set of integers. The set of integers are the ways of giving output one at a time for finite inputs. For well, these finite inputs, you should think of as sequence numbers here. But everything is coded up just as a number here. So I say, whenever I think of a finite amount of information, I'm thinking of some output there. And then if I think of a finitely many of those, that's a finite approximation to f. And what I'm saying is for every continuous function from the power set to the power set, you could have obtained it by taking that collection of pairs and m. I should have written it down on the slide. This is the, the uh, pairs and m. That's just uh, I 
I have the continuous function I've written in boldface f. And so I am saying every continuous function from the power set to the power set is already represented by a subset of n because I just have to think in terms of those finite inputs and outputs. And so it's already determined by thinking of the m's how do I want to say it? I'm losing my breath here. It's just on the tip of my tongue. But the blackboard doesn't taste very good on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, I wanted to say here. Okay. Coding up a continuous function here means I code up the pairs M which come from evaluating the continuous function at the set corresponding to N. And so if N is a finite sequence, N0, N1, and k minus 1, say, OK. Then I'm thinking that take those m's where m belongs to the continuous function applied to the finite set n0, n0, n1, n k minus 1. It's just thinking of a notation for the finite approximations and of course, since I want to think in terms of finite subsets of these things here, I really only have to think of it in terms of one element at a time, because if I know all the particular elements of a set, I know all the finite subsets of the element of sets just by combining them together. So this information is sufficient for determining any continuous function. So that's similar to the proof that says, on the real line that the continuous functions are completely determined by the rational approximations to the function evaluated at rational points. Any continuous function on the real line is determined by a countable amount of information. Every continuous function from the power set to the power set is determined by a countable amount of information and in particular, the way that you can get it for a particular x here is say, oh, give me the finite approximations to x. I'll look them up in the table, and I'll tell you when a finite approximation gains some output. And if you keep doing that over and over again, you'll get all the finite approximations to f of x. Does that make sense? And do you see that there's a simple analogy to the way rational numbers, rational approximations, determine ordinary continuous functions, and finite configurations determine continuous functions on the power set. Mm -hmm. Now, may I may I step in to do another sort of way of saying it, or do we want to move on? Pick a nit. Pick a nit. I'm not going to nitpick. Maybe just an, another way of saying this. Um, maybe going, but yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's go back. No, we can leave it there because we've got we've got application there still at the top. Um, but I mean, the idea here really is that we're we're just writing down the graph of a function. Where it's a t giant table, a giant lookup table, and and but the challenge is, you know, we, this table is supposed to be representing a function that could be applied to an infinite piece of data, and can you have an, an infinite piece of data you know, in your lookup table as, your, as an input spot? And the answer is no, you can't. Okay, so we're just gonna put, in that lookup table, we're gonna have finite approximations, which we can represent as a number, and map it to a finite approximation of the output. Okay, so we just have this giant ta lookup table. And then if you just do, let's say you actually wanna apply this function to an infinite thing, one lookup in that lookup table is not gonna do the job. You might have to do a lot of lookups on all the finite approximations and collect up all the finite outputs. 
And that's really what's going on here with this application here. And then there's and then the rest of the details are just how that encoding is happening with the numbers. Let me continue on with what Jeremy uh, is saying there. Mm -hmm. Once you see that everything could be enumerated in terms of the neighborhoods, you really only have to continue working with sets of integers. You would think in the beginning, if you're taking functions from sets of integers to sets of integers, you have to go up to a higher cardinality. If you do continuous functions, you don't have to go up to a higher cardinality. So, you could say, I have an operation here on sets as lookup tables that give me input-output information, and another set which gives me a lot of input to fool around with. And so we get a binary operation here on uh, sets of integers. Block f and block x are, are sets of integers. And application this way is saying, <coughs> I take the outputs that you get by looking at a finite approximation to x and finding out what its number is. And then you ask in the lookup table, hey, lookup table, did you allow some output now? If you did, I get it. If you didn't, too bad. You just keep finding positive information as you give more and more positive information about x. You look up more and more possible ways of associating output to input from finite sets to particular integers. And then you collect together all the outputs that are licensed by the lookup table. And now you can say, you know that's a continuous binary operation there because a finite amount of information about f of x only will require that you know a finite amount about x and a finite number of pairs in f. So this notion of application is in itself continuous, but by choosing your lookup table, any continuous operation can be obtained. Okay? And so, now the mysterious notation of lambda there, if I have an association of x's to values there that's continuous, I say, okay, We'll just take that lookup table that corresponds to that continuous operation. And then, if you do that, what you get is a lookup table if block f there, if wall face f is a given continuous operation, this will give you a lookup table that you're absolutely certain will always give you the right answers, no matter what key you put in there. Because everything can just be done by enumerating finite configurations here, we can represent everything by a finite set, but sometimes we have to interpret a set as a set of integers, sometimes we have to interpret it as a set of input-output <coughs> agreements. The lookup table means uh, any set of integers can mean anything if you give a different meaning to the integers, so I'm saying I'm giving the meaning to the integers as being uh, pairs, and the pair has to represent a finite set of terms from n and a single output there. And so uh, every lookup table gives me a way of getting one approximation to input to output, and then you can put it all together and achieve any arbitrary continuous function by choosing the right lookup table. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we have a continuous algebra here of application such that this algebra <coughs> represents all continuous functions. So it looks like stuff is fitting together here if you're willing to pay attention only to continuous functions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, everything stays very nice, it's a good exercise too. It says if you had a continuous function of two variables, 
and you made lookup table just with respect to one variable, then of course this is parameterized by another uh, argument here, and that's continuous too. Everything will stay within finite approximations very nicely there. So this should give us lambda calculus. This should give us lambda calculus because what I'm saying is if you think about the topology of power set of n and you think about what data is required for representing continuous functions, you see that everything can be represented by a set of integers. And so a set of integers represents a function, and that function can be applied to any other set of integers. And so we have that possibility that what we're thinking of as functions can be applied to themselves, for example, because we're just representing the functions in terms of sets of integers. Now, I was a graduate student in 57. I knew these people, they're now dead here. My Hill and Shepardson wrote a very beautiful paper about partial recursive functionals, but Hartley Rogers at the same time was teaching uh, recursive function theory at uh, MIT, and he thought of enumeration operators there as being some kind of reduction of decision problems Turing introduced Turing degrees by reduction of uh, decision problems, but you have to use both positive and negative information in Turing's way. But Hartley Rogers says, let's only use the positive information and say, in order to get positive information about reduction, the reduction thing uh, is, is this way, that we do it all in terms of uh, finite approximations. So what he said is, take an enumeration operator, um, F, which is an RE set. Enumeration operator, the way I'm defined here, just given by a set of integers. So he said that B is reduced to A, meaning that if you apply a computable enumeration operator to the set A, <coughs> then it can reinterpret the meaning of the elements of A say in terms of syntactical transformations or whatever you want to do. And then it outputs a whole set B, and you so, so you'll say, B has been reduced to A, if you can recapture B by means of one of these recursion operators applied to the given A there. So my Helen Chervis and dear friends of mine, they said, oh boy, look at all the partial recursive functionals we can define this way. In other words, they had understood lambda abstraction of how you could get these amazing effects. But Hartley Rogers said, look how you can apply one set to another here. And so Hartley Rogers defined abstraction. And they knew each or other. Application, All these people. Yeah. I was a graduate student there. If only I had said, Wait a minute, if you can do abstraction and application, you can do lambda calculus, because lambda calculus needs both a notation for getting the function values and some meaning to a notation for representing a function as one of the objects you're going to work with. If only I had done that in 1957, I would be rich and famous today. <laughs> You can go back and look at those papers and you'll see that uh, you'll see uh, that the ideas were all there and what we're trying to try to explain today, Jeremy and me, is that if you thought in terms of the topology of the power set of N by means of positive information, finite approximations, you should have been able to see that the function space is not complicated as compared to the whole set. Every continuous function can be represented by a set. <coughs> now you have to be a little bit careful here because, uh, did I write it on this one? No, I did I write it. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> ah, yes, you have to be careful there. Note there, if you think in terms of lambda abstraction there, 
if you have a set S and take that definition of uh, application and then apply the lambda abstraction definition back again there, you add in lots more combinations between finite sequences and elements there. Because finite sequences pay no attention to order. Uh, sometimes a few finite sequences are enough to give you all the output you want. And you can be very redundant in getting more finite sequences there. So what happens in this interpretation here, lambda x f of x is the largest lookup table representing the continuous function I was thinking of there. Not every lookup table is the largest lookup table representing the function. Many different lookup tables can give you the same, the same function, but I don't think that's really a flaw uh, in the thing here. What it means, and it actually has a topological meaning, it means the topology of the function space is not the same topology as the topology of, well, maybe I should write this down, it's an important point here. The topology of the function space, if I take the continuous functions, functions from power set of n to power set of n, then I'm representing these as the maximal lookup tables, those f's which are equal to lambda x, f of x. Those are the uniquely one-to-one -one correspondence between continuous functions and sets of integers. And so you see what you get is that the space of continuous functions is only a subset of the space power set of n. And so uh, it works out topologically uh, very, very pleasantly too. You see, if you have a topological space and you take just a family of points there, you can always restrict the topology on the big space to the subspace by saying the open subsets of the subspace are just the intersection between the subspace and open sets. So in other words, this collection here has a topology. And it turns out to be a very nice function space topology. So we get both a topological space of continuous functions by looking at this subset of the power set of n. But topologically, the two topological spaces are not topologically equivalent. But that really isn't a, a bad thing. It's just the way that the things work out according to looking at finite, uh, the, the finite approximations uh, here are just in terms of finite sets. The finite approximations here are in terms of pairs of finite sets. And the way in which the pairs of finite sets uh, give you the, the, the functions there is slightly different from the full power set. But there are lots of super duper properties there. For example, the first thing in my slide there, uh, it's a kind of monotone property to if one function is always approximating another function, then the lookup table for the first function will approximate the lookup table for the second function. And that's an if and only if back and forth. And in fact, with respect to uh, Boolean operations on sets, both intersection and union are continuous operations because the finite approximation to a union requires only a finite approximation to the two parts. The finite approximation to the uh, intersection is a finite approximation to each of there. Those are continuous functions. And this ground abstraction preserves those. That was a question I didn't ask. What is a Boolean operation that is not continuous? Union and intersection is moving out to the top of the end. It's a continuous operation. What's a, a well-known Boolean function that is not continuous? 
Mm -hmm. Negation because it's not monotone. Mm -hmm. Continuous functions have to be monotone. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's an interesting topology where negation would be a continuous function, but there you have to use both positive and negative information about sex, and that's a different topology. But in our topology here, it's the monotone things that have a chance of becoming uh, continuous. And of course, in terms of lookup tables, going back to the idea that uh, Hartley Rogers had, he restricted attention to computable enumeration operators. And so if you get uh, enumeration operator corresponding to a function of several values, this is quite a complicated lookup table. If you go through the definition of this, you have to take finite approximates, finite approximates, finite approximates, things like that. But if it's a set of integers that's recursively enumerable, then that will fit right in with Hartley Rogers' idea that those are the computable enumeration operators. And so we get from power set of n here both built into this interpretation of application and abstraction, we get both properties of topology and properties of computability. And if you want to do uh, recursion, then instead of going the way uh, Church and Kleiner did in terms of the iterators, why not just use the integers themselves? And so the integers are the singleton sets. And you can pr promote n plus 1 to be a set valued function there by saying the successor of a set is just the successor of all the elements of the set. And the predecessor of a set is the set of all predecessors of the elements of x. And testing a set z for 0 means you test. If 0 belongs to z, then you output x. But this is kind of multi-valued functions. We have to say, well, you might also find a positive number in z. So then you have to output y. Of course, if you're very careful which z you put in, you might get only an x or only a y. But if you put in too much information, you get rather more output. But it's easy to see that these are computable continuous operations on sets. And there are a million of them to do there. And so in order to make the relation with uh, recursion theories there, you see that you can go back to those definitions like with a Y combinator uh, to get primitive recursive functions on singletons there, and then you get those. So here is a conclusion of thinking taking the idea that Hartley Rogers and uh, Michael Jefferson had and putting it all together in a single algebra there, we can set up a computable operator on sets such that if we just look at what it does on the singletons, I'll probably, we'll probably set it up so this operator would on a union of sets, just take the union of the values. But I'm really only interested in what it does on the singletons. What I can do is to take all possible combinations a la Curry of K and S. And here I know I can leave out I out of it here. Use the arithmetic combinators and then just say I'm going to number all combinations by saying, oh, I have some given combinators. Now you go ahead and combine them in all possible ways, pair by pair by pair by pair by pair. Now, if you would, if you would nail me to the wall here, I could actually write out the definition using the Y combinator here that will give this. But I hope you think it's possible that because the ingredients KS tensor are all computable recursively enumerable sets. And because the application operator is a computable operator, then you will be able to make up a master recursion 
that enumerates all these compositions. And lo and behold, that's the universal Turing machine. It's an enumeration of all possible recursively enumerable sets. Of course, on one slide here, you can't see how you get any good properties out of these things here. But I just want to indicate that once you see about indexing by using those uh, finite sets, and once you have the ability to do lambda calculus, which gives you application and the Y combinator to do recursion, you get a recursively enumerable enumeration of all possible recursively enumerable sets. And so uh, I was able to use the two and other proofs mm -hmm. to, rather than going back Maybe to... Maybe one, one more comment. Let, let me finish one okay. sentence. Yep. Going back to uh, Turing machines, uh, you see, Turing machines are a bit more like operational semantics of where you say, I have to follow a program and do step, step by step by step. And so what I've done here is put all of those structures just into the notation with pairs of the integers there. And I don't have to do that kind of operational semantics that that Turing machines do. That's nothing against Turing machines. He was a genius to think of them at the time, but also as part of my uh, part of my uh, sermon here. <laughs> after Claney discovered how to do predecessor and lambda calculus in terms of church numerals, Claney sat down and used everything he learned from Gödel about Gödel numbering and syntax to show that. Every Gödel, Erbron Gödel, higher type recursive uh, equations could always be done in lambda calculus by giving a lot of horrible notation to notate all the possible steps that computation would have to go through. So Claney did that work directly influenced by by Gödel, what Gödel did for provability and predicate calculus. Claney did by computability with Ebron Kirtle uh, complicated uh, recursion equations. And so he proved that lambda definability of numerical functions was equivalent to uh, Ebron Kirtle. Then it was a depression. Claney had to go to get a job. Rosser was lucky he got a fellowship in Harvard and the Society of Fellows. But then they went off to their careers and their own jobs. Claney and Rosser never met Turing. Turing was only in England for two years because the war was about to start. Uh, he, of course, it was amazing that he had found the uh, non-decidability question for the provability and predicate calculus and uh, Church had had another version of it. And uh, so he was able then, under Church's suggestions to do some more investigation in lambda calculus to get his PhD just in two years. I mean, he was very, very, uh, very, very young. But he wanted to go back to England because of uh, looming possibility that it would be needed for the war effort. And of course, he did amazing contributions to the war effort with, uh, with the uh, cryptography and uh, so on. There. But the sad thing is, he never met Gödel Rosser and Claney, but when he saw Claney's paper showing that lambda computability was equivalent to Ebron Gödel computability, he simply sat down and wrote out a proof using the same things that lambda definability is equivalent to Turing computability because you just synthesize all the functions you need for syntactical transformations to show a proof of one kind can be done by a proof of another kind. So I really think Claney should get much more credit. And then he went on to develop the theory of recursive functions. Claney should get much, much more credit because not only did he apply all the things he learned from Gödel, but he went on and really made recursive function theory uh, a, a, you know, a field of mathematics. We had a, a 
centenary um, celebration of uh, Turing in Berkeley uh, in the 12th. And um, then someone asked, what would Turing have been working on if he had lived? I immediately said he wouldn't have been working in recursive function theory. The reason I think that, it's my own opinion, recursive function theory is very technical. If you look at the papers on it, the papers are extremely technical. Turing didn't like that sort of thing. He invented his thing <coughs> from first principles. And the Turing machine was the first principle of, you know, just calculation with paper and pencil. And that but he wasn't really interested in the elaboration of all the things. And of course, he would have been horrified by the fact that Turing reducibility, the, the theory of Turing degrees, leads to absolutely horrible structures. The lattice of Turing degrees is horrible. No one has ever come up with a natural example of a degree of decidability in between decidable and the maximal one of uh, computability. So uh, Turing wouldn't have uh, done that, but of course AI would have been completely different had Turing lived for one thing, and he was interested in a million uh, different things. I think we'll have to take our break now, mm -hmm. uh, because some coffee is needed through. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So I think there's a coffee break at 3.30. Um, Did we start? No, we started at 1. <coughs> yeah. I mean, there'll be coffee out. Well, maybe there's coffee out there now. I don't know. Yeah. When should we reconvene? In an hour, I guess. Isn't that the way we... Is it, what's on the schedule? Is it in an hour? Yeah, it would... Yeah, so... Oh. The scheduled coffee break is 3.30 to 4, I think. No. Oh, it's 3 to 3.30? Okay, good. I'm confused. Perfect. Great. Okay, so in a half an hour then. Come back in half an hour. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Mm. Oh, I have to sit down. My legs are turning. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Question to which the short answer. So, the, in early definition, you replace the finite set with the effectively open and closed set. Do you get the same topology or different one? So, so, they, so if if you. So you're talking about the definition of a topology, like yeah, yeah, the P of N topology? Yeah. Right. And like there, the notion of a neighborhood was a neighborhood is a finite set. Yeah. And then all the all the sets that include that set, right? Yeah. Okay. So we replaced the, the basis. Uh -huh. uh, well, it, was, it was like a finite set. Yeah. Right. So you're saying so replace that with... with effectively open and close. Uh, or and you still have another one over here. Effectively open or effectively closed set. Well, we're trying to define the notion of what is open. When you're, oh, okay. that's what you're doing when you're defining a basis. Is you might switch you guys. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Here, I'll put this. Right, so okay. So there's two. There's topology and there's routes. Yeah. 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 If I were to ask, if I have a question, should I ask you later? Okay. okay. Deciding on. Yeah. 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 There we go. Right. So it's so on top of that.